We're going to do this in English. Um, so first of all, welcome to uh, our set and to Teaching Design Conversations. And we are very happy to be here and also very happy to have you all here. Um, yeah. yeah, we, this is um, Lisa Baumgarten. Um, she's a designer, educator, and researcher. Currently, she's teaching at Hochschule uh, in Halle. Um, but also at the University of Arts in Berlin. And she's doing her master degree in cultural um, and gender studies at the Humboldt University here in Berlin. And to my left is Anja Neithardt. Um, she's a PhD candidate at the UMIO Institute of Design and the UMIO, um, and the UMIO Center for Gender Studies in Sweden. So she came here extra from Sweden to do this with me um, and she has worked um, as design journalist for many years and she's also the co-creator of Depatriotized Design that's an online platform which you might already know um, just to give you a little bit of context who we are yeah, yes. okay. yeah. um, this project here is um, very important to us it has grown out of many conversations that the two of us had in design education um, it's much more than just a library or just an exhibition. It also shows the current state of the collaboration and the exchange that we have, but also between the two of us, but also between us and many collaborators and many um, people who are also here today as our guests. When we met each other, we um, spoke a lot about our own experiences as design educators and we started to exchange thoughts on how we might um, change things um, and teaching structures that we are in and also sharing material. Like many others who are here today or who are involved in similar projects like this one, uh, we are interested in a shift and we are convinced that the design discipline has to change because design is very much involved in Structures. Um, it's very much involved in creating the world we live in, and on the same, on the other hand, the world we live in uh, influences how we design. So the design discipline is very much involved in structures that either privilege people or discriminate against people in certain aspects. And um, yeah, we believe that it is crucial to um, change the way we teach design in order to um, change the discipline and the structures that is involved in. And um, as designers, but um, above all as educators um, at design academies and universities, um, we are part of this discourse and we influence the um, communication of information and thus we have a responsibility what we teach and how we teach it. Um, and Anja and me, we are both very interested in applying intersectional feminist and decolonial perspectives in our practices as educators um, because they offer alternative ways of doing, learning and teaching design. Um, but those perspectives, even though they exist, uh, are very hard to find. That's how we felt when we started the conversation that it's really um, difficult sometimes to get access to texts um, and they're very hidden and um, so we were sharing a lot of, uh, during this process we were sharing a lot of questions but also sharing our frustrations about it and then um, yeah, ideas of starting to look for alternative sources and that's why we basically created Teaching Design because we wanted to uh, make the materials, the sources that we found, more accessible for people who are also interested in this topic, who are also searching for alternative strategies. And also because we think it's very important that we connect with each other and learn from each other how we can um, transform teaching structures. Um, because when you are, um, maybe, maybe some of you know, if you have a lectureship at a university, um, there's not a real network between the lecturers um, and it's, I think it's very important to share and to also support each other and be allies in this. Um, 
Exactly, and uh, we started this platform on Instagram um, because it's a very easy and convenient way of sharing images and also getting into a conversation about it by um, writing comments and um, discussing. Um, so, exactly, we have this Instagram account, um, but also this exhibition now. So it all led to it's all build, building up on on each other. Yeah. And um, with the support of Anja Lutz and her team, it became possible to bring the library and our events into the physical space, space that we are in here today. It is very important for us to acknowledge um, the work of everyone who was and is involved in this project here, um, especially since we were not able to um, secure funding for this project. This leads us, of course, to the fact that not only design, but cultural production and education are part of capitalist structures. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So we have to um, thank Anja Lutz and the Artist Set team uh, for providing the space and the infrastructure and for the support in planning the exhibition. And um, thank Iman Gabriel, um, Stefanie Rau, and Madeleine Morley, who will um, create the program for tonight. Um, Antonia Schneemann, who I'm doing a, a workshop with on Saturday, and uh, Jung Jung Lee and Lieben Lahai, they are coming for a reading next week. Um, we have to thank you for being our conversational partners and um, creating the program with us. Our thanks also goes to Fabrice Höfgen for the spatial concept and to Peter Baerbohm for designing the exhibition furniture. Thank you also, Benedetta Kripa, for designing the beautiful curtains that you can see here. And thank <coughs> you, Yolanda Hose, for sewing it. And we have to also to thank Katja Reichert and Jesko Feser, who from uh, Pro Quadratmeter, that's a very cool bookshop um, around the corner, they provided um, a couple of books from the library, and they have a little sticker on the back, um, and they can be bought on the last day here. Um, directly in the space. Um, and Paul Steinmann, thank you for many conversations and feedback. And thank you also Maya Ober um, and to Patrick has designed for um, a lot of inspiration and for informing our thinking. Yes, the font um, that you can see here on the window but also on the description um, is called Kai. Kalitzes and is provided by Charlotte Wood. Thanks to our partners, Cut and Bee, for supporting the textile print and tea, tea manufacturer for providing the delicious tea for our events. Which we don't have, which we don't serve tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we have to come again. Sorry. And last but not, not least, we thank everyone who contributed resources to our online video conference. Yes. Yeah, many things. <laughs> and um, yeah, now we'd like to introduce our first conversational partners who will share their experiences in three short talks with us. And uh, we will introduce um, each of them briefly. And um, after the individual presentations, um, you are invited to ask questions and we will open the conversation and hopefully have a lively discussion. So, our first uh, guest and speaker is Ima Jekali. He is a creative director and researcher specializing in identity representation and bilingual visual communication. He has produced visual and theoretical works around self-orientalism in Arab design, subjective mapping, and archiving. After years of experience as creative director of Mojo Inc., a creative studio based in the UAE with clients from the public and private sectors across the Middle East. He moved to the Netherlands to complete a master's degree in graphic design. He is currently engaged in ethnographic research on the Arab Muslim post-colonial identity in the context of Zonali subject of his PhD at the Institute for European Ethnology at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Thanks for being here. 
Thank you. Um, should, I, should I introduce everyone first? Or? No, I no? Just okay. No. Sorry. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think I'm going to kick it off with um, a bit of history, not because I want to bore you to death, but because it's important to explain um, the comparatives I will draw um, during my conversation. So I had the experience and the privilege to study in different formats. So I did my bachelor in Beirut, Lebanon. I did my master's in the Netherlands, and now I'm in Germany. Um, what I'm going to do is not necessarily like a one-to-one -one comparative, but it's more um, within the context of uh, colonial versus decolonial education. <laughs> I would do better on this um, And uh, basically, uh, just to, to put you in, in, in some context, with you some context about uh, Lebanon, um, I don't think we had a day when, when like, we were not colonized in some way, so um, going back to that history and our relationship with the coloniality, uh, we had our independence from the French on, um, around 1943, and that's exactly when our history books stopped, so we haven't written history since 1943. Um, there is no trace about what happened after. What happened after is that we had a few years of uh, independence and then we fell into civil war for 25 years. I mean, debatable because it was longer. Um, and then we had Syrian occupation and then corruption and the results. But we never wrote that history because there was no consensus over who did what and who didn't do what. Um, so basically, that's a quick history. Um, just to situate, um, just to situate education in general in Lebanon and design education in particular, um, we study in uh, French systems. So it's been until now that most of the courses we take at school are all in French, and most of the school systems and universities are established by missionaries. So they're private schools established by a group of nuns. Uh, or priests uh, as form of public education because the private education, sorry, because the public education doesn't really work. So uh, that led to the first program um, in graphic design in the, in, in the whole region actually. It was the first program was in Lebanon in 92. There was other programs starting before they weren't necessarily um, fitting to the idea of what graphic design is, but officially it's 1992 at the American University um, in Beirut. It's a pioneer program, but if just to give you, to crunch few numbers with you, one semester at AUB costs $13,000, and a whole degree at AUB costs between $90,000 and $130,000 to $150,000. So that's the cost of a graphic design bachelor from like, the top university um, in Lebanon. I didn't study there, of course. <laughs> I studied at a much cheaper place with a full-time job. Um, um, but to, this was just to contextualize a bit and to put the, the concept of graphic design in this, in this situation where to be a good graphic designer, you have to be buy it, basically. You have to invest in yourself financially. That's the sort of system. Um, and there is no talk in Lebanon about decoloniality using the word decolonial. There's a talk in Lebanon about uh, teaching uh, or like training designers uh, um, with Arabic, Arabic script. As a result, for like the end of the war, there was like open markets, the Gulf region, so Dubai, um, and the Gulf region had a lot of uh, opportunities and, the, and opportunities were really well paid, so there was a need, there was a lack and a need for designers to actually um, get trained in Arabic, and it was not on any political grounds of any sort, and it's still not until today. Um, the, question, the question was to bridge that gap and to establish new markets post-war, designers needed commercial tools, and this led to most graphic design programs in Lebanon to be heavily invested in um, fin financial opportunities, basically. So, um, and that's the, the situation. Lately, um, there has been 
a total decrease in amount of enrollment in graphic design. I don't know why, I mean, I, I mean you can guess. But there's no um, official relationship between what's happening and, and design in Lebanon. Uh, criticality is not um, relatively something that students are engaged with. It's still a very um, aesthetic um, education that is usually placed within um, architecture schools or communication art schools, so advertising. So it's either advertising or architecture. Um, and that led me, I mean, I graduated from my bachelor with a thesis on design and capitalism, and then I um, traveled to the Netherlands to do a master's, and I chose a wide program, so a, a graphic design program, because I was really torn between like trend, trend degrees in, in design education, and a context where I can actually uh, do theory. Um, however, the Dutch um, design system places design in art schools, like mostly like here as well. And that's a big, in my opinion, and it could be like the first impulse to throw in uh, into that conversation is one of the biggest hurdles that face design now is its, um, is its positioning within the art academy. I think it discredits a lot of critical design work and it renders research and criticality as, a, as like a non-factoring uh, element in design education. So if you want to be critical, great. If you don't want to, you can. And um, basically, questioning becomes an option. Criticality becomes an option. And in my opinion, that dilutes a lot of the design work. Uh, the struggle in, in the masters uh, was that for accreditation purposes, you cannot produce a theoretical outcome. And I was working on a theoretical outcome on um, uh, post-colonial identity and Orientalism. And that wasn't possible because for accreditation purposes you have to produce a visual project, which I did eventually. Um, but that's another structure pro problem within design education and this is something we can discuss as well um, for educators or for people who are immersed in like university systems on the possibility to actually encourage students to graduate with research as, as a legit and valid design um, outcome. And um, I don't want to take a lot of time, but the last step was that I um, came to Berlin and I was working on different research projects along, like in parallel with my work that I do for Abu Dhabi. Um, my research led me to actually finding a route outside design and more in social sciences where um, I controversially would like to state that I think design should belong within cultural studies, not within the art academy. And this is where I am. I'm exiting the field, a foot in, a foot out. And I think I keep meeting designers that are in that same situation. And I think if we can discuss something tonight, it would be on like the politics of having a foot in, a foot out. And whether those politics are actually um, the right step and actually should we keep being um, have asked researchers or should we actually go hardcore into scientific research and maybe be half asked designers since design nowadays is becoming the subjective world of um, it's either solutionist so let's find solutions for problems that we often invent and not they don't exist in, in, in the most part or we reach or we go towards this trend of like absurdity and like is absurd aesthetics where we're like the more absurd and the, the more problematic the work is the more famous we are like a lot of the current design studios so this duality is something on the table that we can maybe um, discuss that's all <laughs> Stephanie Rau. Uh, Stephanie Rau moves with her work between the fields of graphic design, text-based artistic practices, and teaching. In a form of autocritic, should I say that word? In a form of autocritic, Stephanie will reflect now on her experiences and involvement in self-organized educational projects and her work at the Weissensee Academy of Art 
where she started teaching in 2019. Okay, <clears throat> I think I'm gonna um, break the circle. <laughs> Speak to all of you. Mm -hmm. um, a little text that I will read out and it might take around 10 minutes. Um, oh yeah, but first my notes say thanks for the invitation. <laughs> um, I'm very honored to speak here because um, and I was actually also surprised because also looking at the crowd I know that there are people here who have a lot more experience in the field of teaching design than I have and um, yeah, so that just as a footnote. Yeah, the, the text that I'm going to read out is kind of fragmented, uh, very quickly written, and so the, uh, in English there might be some grammar mistakes, and the, the language is clumsy, so bear with me. Okay, since almost a year, I hold a permanent teaching position at the Weissensee Art Academy here in Berlin. Since then, when I'm asked what I do, I now also say I teach. In German, I would say, ich unterrichte, which in my ears still sounds kind of funny. But also, it made me think about what that actually means. Unterrichten. The preposition unter can be in English translated to under, beneath. It describes a physical relation and assumes an over or above. The verb richten means in English to direct, to straighten, or also to judge. In German, this word is connected to Richtung, direction, to richtig, which means right or correct, and to Richter, again, the judge. So these words include connotations that I only reluctantly connect to this new practice of mine. There is no correct or right direction, but there are many. However, one can also understand the Unter as a monist. So not as a description of an up and down, but of a relationship to one another, being amongst each other, untereinander sein. Immediately followed by the question, how to be amongst each other. During my time as a student, I was dissatisfied with some of the educational spaces that I entered. I transferred schools, went from a school for applied arts to an art academy. The frustrations changed from a restrictive stru uh, study structure to something that I would call a lack of support or the realization of how powerful hierarchies can be. I was not only frustrated, it was also great, but okay. <laughs> um, Through this frustration, I became involved in a project that has become very important for me and formed my relationship to teaching and learning. It is called Parallel School. On its most fundamental level, it's a workshop concept which is based on the idea that every participant is equally student and teacher at the same time. So everybody who takes part contributes something into the space, something that can be shared with the group, an activity, an exercise, a discussion, etc. It's about learning from each other, getting to know each other instead of focusing on the result or an outcome. This created a special energy and an atmosphere that I only rarely experience within regular educational settings. In Teaching to Transgress, Bell Hooks writes, quote, as a classroom community, our capacity to generate excitement is deeply affected by our interest in one another, in hearing one another's voices, in recognizing one another's presence. In my new position as a teacher, my goal is to create a similar space and energy. I'm learning that for me, teaching has a lot to do with exactly this difficult task, to create a space, not so much the physical space, even though that one is incredibly important as well, but more the atmosphere of an environment that is inviting, that is encouraging, that allows everyone equally to contribute, but also allows for vulnerability and doubt. But I have to realize that the space that I partake is already filled and occupied and permeated by circumstances and conditions that I have to react to. A space that inherently functions totally different to something like parallel school and is situated in a context and in certain structures. The main course that I'm offering in Weissensee is obligatory for all first year students who study in six different design or fine art programs. 
and are entering their first year of study with very different expectations. Werkstattkurs, typographie und layout. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, full days from 10 to 5. One course overall lasts six days. The course corresponds to a certain number of credit points, which I grant for my signature. We have been allocated a room with specific spatial structure, with architectural limitations and possibilities. <coughs> with computers that run on one system with a set of programs that we are expected to use. Furthermore, the school itself is a, is a place that has a specific history, has evolved and changed over the years, and is animated by the people who inhabit the space, as students, or as teachers, or as the staff in the workshops, or as the administration. Since I started to teach regularly, I looked back differently to the time when I studied myself and entered and occupied the educational spaces in a completely different way. Only now I do realize that everything that happens within this space is perceived by the person in the front. Every facial expression, every posture is visible. I see every pleasurable yawn, every look at the mobile phone, every bored stare. As a student, I did not notice this so much. <laughs> I perceived myself as part of a group in which I seemed to disappear as an individual. Similarly to now, maybe the situation of you being the audience and... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I learned that within these gestures, unconsciously, the power relations within the space are challenged. These are moments in which I realize that I cannot create the space by myself. It's a social space that formulates itself through the relationships within it. And maybe the goal should be to create a space in which every participant is aware of their position, their responsibility, and their active contribution in co-creating co the space for teaching and learning. I remember that as a high school student, I liked looking into the eyes of my teachers, on the one hand, because I felt that I could follow them more easily, but also I noticed that they then actually would look back. An exchange of attention which I now perceive from them as well. Teaching is essentially a physical activity, bodies together in space. In German, my official position is called Künstlerische Lehrkraft, literally translated meaning something like teaching power or teaching force. If you change one letter in the word, exchange the H with an E, the word would sound exactly the same, Lehrkraft, but the meaning exchanges into something like empty power. It makes me think about the fact that I constantly struggle with self-doubt if I'm actually qualified for the position that I hold. I question my ability to create a space that is inviting, that is encouraging, that enables everyone to contribute, and I feel that way because I have actually not been taught how to do that. My pedagogical education is based on self-organized um, educational projects and the occasional seminar that I taught for my theory professor while being a student um, myself. And now I'm still studying in a very privileged, privileged position as part of an institution, but together with the students that I share the space with, I am mainly learning. Learning not only how to create empowering spaces, but also with what and how they should be filled. Learning how to teach typography without limiting it to a practice that is carried out by Max and Erik and Paul, but also by Carol and Gutun and Susanna, and by those who, whose work we might know, but whose names we might have never heard of. Questioning how important these faces behind the typefaces actually are or should be to recognize the many different directions that there are within different alphabets and writing systems, to realize how restricting the software is that we are advised to use, to acknowledge the circumstances in which the Latin alphabet replaced other language and writing systems, so to teach typography in a way that I have not learned about it during my education. It therefore seems that in these terms I am back in the realm of self-organized education, not in the parallel school, but for example in this space, among you, learning to navigate the different possible directions of teaching design. Thank you very much.